So welcome to the last session. It's uh, late in the afternoon. We have learned a lot today. We have had a number of questions, and it's a pleasure and a privilege to chair this final session, which we may be able to uh, cut a little bit shorter than uh, on the program since we're late. Um, I'm Elu von Tudden, Professor of Economics in Mannheim at Mannheim University and also a member of ECGI. I'm also, uh, I have the honor of being the chairman of the European Corporate Governance Research Foundation, a organization that is uh, supporting research in corporate governance in Europe and uh, is in particular um, in particular supporting ECGI and this summit and uh, I am happy and proud to say that uh, this summit is I think one of the uh, great new developments of ECGI that we are proud to fund. There are strong partners in the research foundation and uh, I think we are very happy to see the way ECGI is responding to this funding and uh, I would also like to uh, add a personal note of thanks to Marco, Marco Becht who is uh, behind much of what this summit but what this summit stands for and also for the direction ECGI has been taking in the last few years. And uh, Marco, thanks a lot for having taken the initiative and for taking ECGI to this higher level, which we are now hopefully beginning at this summit with the new initiative, which is uh, worth funding, that is for sure. Thank you. So having said this, let me introduce our two panelists. We're not going to have a standard panel with back and forth like Philip did it uh, in the previous panel. We are having the opportunity to, in fact, conclude on a slightly different tune because this is now a panel about some policy conclusions. There's a lot of open questions and uh, definitely policy can't respond to all of that. Uh, but we are fortunate to have two uh, outstanding members here on the stage who will uh, offer their thoughts about what we have learned and what we may take away from this discussion in a broader sense. We have uh, uh, Vasiliki Lazaraku, uh, who is um, maybe what uh, Yanis Antetokounmpo is for the NBA, namely uh, the Greek star in the European financial regulatory scene. And uh, she is the head of the, I have to look this up because uh, this is difficult to, uh, it's easy to get wrong, chair of the Hellenic Capital Market Commission. Each of these institutions has their own name. But uh, to some extent even more interesting, at least to me today, is that she is uh, in fact, a, a member of the management board of ESMA, of the European Securities Market Authority. So she has an inside view on regulation and supervision and therefore represents a, uh, or can present a view that complements our more private capital views uh, on the corporate governance problem that we have discussed today. Um, we then have Carmeli Noya from the OECD. In fact, Carmeli also has several hats on. And uh, for those of you who know him, he was, uh, in fact, commissioner at, the, at CONSERP in Italy and uh, has then switched to the OECD, where I should also be careful to read his correct title, the OEC Directorate for Financial and Enterprise Affairs, which is one of the largest, maybe even as he explained over lunch, the largest directorate at the OECD, with an enormous amount of initiatives that in fact are uh, highly pertinent for what we're discussing today. And in particular, he has been instrumental in the revision of the G20 OECD principles of corporate governance uh, that speak to many issues discussed today, in particular sustainability and related issues. And uh, as it turns out, and as he told me in the preparation of this session, 
um, in fact, the uh, consultation period for this revision is ending today. So I'm not sure whether there is still much to be contributed to that version, but I'm sure, Carmine, you will tell us all about it. And uh, therefore, I suggest that we are starting this uh, final uh, session with Carmine's contribution, and then we hand it over to you, Vasiliki. Okay? Carmine, please, go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot, and thanks for, uh, for this invitation to the CGI, and in particular to Marco Becht, and I'm happy that also we're having this, uh, and we will, I think, uh, strengthen also, the, the, again, the collaboration and the interaction with the CGI is very important for us, and also in this, my, my new role. Now, it's, uh, it's 5.38, so you have more, slightly more than six hours still to contribute, because today, so it's the last day, so let's try to be short, Vasiliki, because I would like to, that they have, so <laughs> today is the last day of, of the consultation. We had five weeks uh, open consultation on, on the, on the uh, draft revision of, uh, of, of the principles. And, uh, um, but actually, I'm also very happy that uh, I saw and I appreciated the many uh, also comments on the ECGI blog. Uh, there were different uh, comments by, by different uh, ECGI members and, uh, and uh, and uh, so I think uh, in part uh, we will, and actually we're already receiving a lot of, uh, of, of, of answers, but uh, apart from the public period, I think uh, there will be, it will be a long process, so it will be interesting uh, to, 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 to hear you know, from you uh, even more. Now, maybe uh, just, I mean, to concentrate on that, because I would say it's, it's directly related to, for on many things that we, we have seen has been a very interesting uh, you know day. I arrived slightly late, so when a bit just before the uh, Commissioner Crenshaw, but I, I, I really it has been a very a very very rich day. Uh, one thing, but also it was in the in the last round table. Obviously, is that when we talk about uh, you know uh, um, ESG climate change, I mean we, there is an urgency. I mean to act and to do collectively. Uh, uh, and this is a very simple point. The second point is that whatever you want to do, it will be very expensive in terms of money. And, uh, and so point number three is that this money also cannot come all uh, from uh, the, you know, the public sector, but also coming from the private sector. And this is true. We need also the, the, the contribution of uh, so corporation and capital markets alike. Uh, we need to play so an important role in all the... Uh, improvement, the transition, net zero, I mean, all what we have, uh, we have said. And, uh, but actually, and one important thing in partly is also related maybe to, to, to what uh, also uh, Professor Howe was saying is that uh, there are already some clear incentives uh, to, to act. Um, we have uh, our data, have colleagues here, that uh, all the research on climate change uh, already is a, is a financially material risk for companies which represent uh, two-thirds of global market cap. So this is already quite, uh, quite obvious and quite evident in, for companies. Now the topic is how we can uh, you know, ensure and, uh, that this, uh, this uh, you know, endeavor become a uh, reality. And that is where maybe the corporate governance, a corporate governance framework, and corporate governance frameworks come into play. So setting the traditional issues of corporate governance, so duties of uh, of uh, uh, role and duties of boards, uh, so providing also the right tools for for shareholders, maybe and ensuring that shareholders and stakeholders and the different kind of stakeholders alike can can engage with companies and and uh, on sustainability as well as on other issues. And this is, has been the traditional paradigm. So. Corporate governance, and this is important, we, I think we, we, we want to be clear in the principles, it's not an end in itself, uh, but also you know, what are the main, you know, uh, the main purpose. Uh, uh, there are various, but uh, it's important that, uh, I mean, you know, provide companies with access uh, you know, to market-based financing. Market-based financing, not necessarily only equity, we always have to think about other kind, and, uh, and for, by the way, we have an important new part in the principles and consultation on bond, and in particular on disclosure on covenants, but that's a long story. But uh, so market-based financing allowing uh, uh, so companies to finance, in particular, green investment and innovation. So this is absolutely necessary in this fight. Now, one key policy aspect that in part was also discussed this morning by, by SEC Commission, obviously, is disclosure. Okay. 
as, as climate issues have become more urgent, so it's important. Uh, there is a clear increase in demand, obviously, but coming also from the market, investors, uh, actual and potential shareholders and stakeholders uh, for companies to disclose, I would say, climate-related information in general. So, and in order for investors that want to take sustainable uh, considerations, uh, sustainability considerations into account for their uh, fair uh, capital allocation to, to be able. So it's important to have disclosure. Disclosure, and it was said or mentioned also this morning, there is already a lot of disclosure. Commissioner Kresha was clear. The problem is that uh, we need uh, that uh, disclosure must be, you know, as we write in the principle, clear, uh, consistent, uh, and comparable. So we need uh, this kind of data to, 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 for, for investors. And so just uh, we, nothing new, it's just what we have or we try to have, or we try to monitor and enforce when uh, for financial disclosure. But actually, corporate governance framework is not just about disclosure. Uh, and so ensuring that also so the principles are fit for purpose in, in, in a changing world is not, is not an easy task. And so that's why we have uh, the, the revision of, of uh, the G20 OECD principles. G20 OECD principles, born in 1999, I would say influence we're discussing, we call it Meyer, obviously at that time, from, I would say, from UK, but then has been, you know, revised uh, uh, first, a second revision, endorsed by G20. So this is an important, uh, I would say, international uh, uh, standard, okay, also by the G20 non-OECD, endorsed in 2015. That's why, like, I would say, corporate governance codes and corporate governance uh, framework in different, uh, you know, at the national and supranational level, European are, are adapted are changed, it, it doesn't mean that they were wrong, but you need adaptation. So these are for the principle, which by the way, is clearly written in one of the blog, uh, by Rolf Skog on uh, one of the blog, uh, Rolf is, is a member of the committee, uh, of the bureau of the committee. This is not a corporate governance code, okay, uh, for companies. These are principles for members, for states. Uh, principle one is about actually the adequacy, not only the governance of the institutional framework, okay. So uh, they, 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 as many other standards of the OECD, they are for policymakers, so to, to, to evaluate and improve legal, regulatory, and institutional framework of corporate governance. And by the way, allowing and actually strengthening the interplay of regulation and self-regulation of the different body that they are there. So leading global standard, 53 jurisdictions, by the way, and they are uh, actually a key standard also for the FSB. They're used by World Bank IMF for, for, uh, for uh, uh, also for, for um, the assessment. Now, the current focus of the revision, as may, some of you may have seen, is actually on sustainability issues and actually on, notably, on the management of, of climate-related risk. And uh, so this process, I think, for also all of you, <laughs> it's, it's a, a unique opportunity, in a sense, to, to coordinate, uh, you know, also uh, efforts in a truly international forum. Our members at the table, delegation of the, of the countries are you know, typically mm, treasuries, finance minister, justice ministers, uh, regulators. Uh, Vasiliki is there, uh, SEC is there, uh, and, uh, and the central banks. Okay. So why? Uh, and then interaction uh, members with uh, also you know, other stakeholders of the committee, because this is a global issue. Okay. And so a global approach to a global problem. Now, the biggest change, and I understand that there was a sort of a Marco spoil, uh, there was a spoiler this morning. The bigger change is, is in the draft revision is, is a new chapter on sustainability and resilience. It's also raised the interest of another, and also an old friend and an ECG, ESE, ECGI uh, member, Guido Ferrarini, wrote on the blog, who wrote this article. Uh, and, uh, and okay, we, we have to confess that a couple of people are here in this room, but uh, no, actually, this is, a, this, is a, this is the effort also of, no, actually, it's the effort, it's not coming from us, it's from the committee. This is a very long process, and very democratic process, I would say. And also, but uh, for you, for some of you, maybe you, you, if you have seen maybe the revision, but not what is on the, on, on the website, we published the revision together with a lot of papers. And as always, we try to, to do, I mean, economists, uh, we try to do at the OECD to have, uh, you know, evidence-based, okay, analysis uh, in order to get, you know, 
policy conclusion. So we have, for example, there is, I think, an interesting report, maybe some of you read it, on climate change and corporate governance. And, and uh, so this chapter, is chapter six, br brings together guidance on corporate governance issues uh, from a cross-cutting perspective and addresses of corporate disclosure, stake uh, shareholders, boards, and stakeholders. Um, now, the draft revision so promotes the disclosure of financial and non-financial information, and so we, 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 we know that we're uh, also working on, uh, on, uh, on eggs or on ice, uh, and also on what is uh, trying uh, the effort that we're having with ISSB, building block approach. Uh, IOSCO had an important role. By the way, Vasilik is a member of the, also the, 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 IOSCO, the IOSCO board. Um, so building block approach, very, very important. Why it's important? Because we need, uh, uh, so markets are global, financial markets are global, but especially when we deal with these topics, uh, as we, we were mentioning this morning, this is even more global. So uh, it's, uh, we, we, we must be careful, um, I mean, some of, uh, we need leaders, as we were mentioned this morning, but if you, you do not win a gold medal if you are running a different race. So that's why we need some, a global approach. Now, the draft revision also seeks to provide guidance on uh, the concept of materiality, evoked uh, many times also today. And uh, while the new draft chapter, and by the way, yeah, maintains a definition that is close to what we all know is financially you know, material, and I, I have to stop here. I'm in Brussels, I've been working uh, not only uh, I mean, Commissioner Colso before in uh, Sonime, 15 years, uh, we're working uh, with um, um, some I mentioned uh, European issues. I mean, we take for granted that for us materiality is a common concept. But materiality and what is price sensitive is not a common concept. I mean, uh, uh, as we know in the, uh, in the US, this is basically to course. In Europe, in the U27, we even have a regulation, market abuse regulation, and uh, no one knows what is uh, uh, what must be disclosed as a price sensitive information because everyone has different interpretation. That's why hopefully in a few weeks we will have a listing act uh, uh, tackling also this problem. And I, I go on. I go on. But so these uh, recognize. We try to 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 discuss the two con the two notions, not going to in a, in, a, in a direction clear on on a, okay, it's better materiality, double materiality. Again, building block approach. We have to find consensus. But we recognize that there is sort of dynamic nature, as we write in, in the Article 6, of materiality. And so with the perspective of investor with large portfolio, and we heard, we, we heard some of them today. So for example, sustainability risks that may not seem to be financially material, uh, but that are relevant to society, you know, more broadly, uh, may reasonably be expected to become financially material for a company at some point in the future. This is one of the, the examples we, we, we are giving. And in addition, and this is related to what uh, Professor I was saying, uh, a company's influence of non-diversifiable risks, uh, as we write, may be material to, to, to investors. As an example, so when you have, uh, so an investor may consider the value created by a, a negative externality, by a, a, major car, a major carbon emitting company in their portfolio, will be offset by losses in the value of other investee companies that are negatively affected by climate change, is one of the examples uh, this morning. So therefore, for an investor, Investor perspective, even negative externalities that may not, may not be internalized by, by a specific investee company might not be highly, highly relevant. So the new draft chapter, chapter six on sustainability also seeks, uh, and we actually, we, we eliminate one, but we create a new one, putting together a lot of information in part and principles and uh, that were recommendation in others, but also having new things. And also, I saw in the ECGI uh, blog, uh, there were different opinions on that, if it's better to have a separate on, or, or not. But also seeks to promote uh, the dialogue between directors, key executives, shareholders, and stakeholders. Uh, we do not enter explicitly, and, and is, a, is, a, is a choice in the debate of the purpose of cooperation. But there are, I think, issues uh, that can be, uh, that can be uh, important there, um, and I was, uh, listening in particular to, to, to Professor Hart and, and his ideas with Luigi Zingale, so the shareholder welfare maximization. Now, we may think that we address indirectly this issue. We, we highlight uh, that boards uh, should explicitly, should ensure that governance practices, strategy and risk management policies adequately consider, always, material sustainability risks and opportunities. 
Also, I, I, I discussed with, with uh, Professor Hart after, after his uh, presentation, actually we identify that uh, for-profit companies may be allowed to adopt public benefit objectives as long as dissenting shareholders are protected. We do, do not put in the, in the published version of, of the consultation other parts. Okay, there are also interesting numbers, not so uh, big, especially in the States, uh, seven companies in Delaware, uh, but, but okay, it's interesting. Okay, we clarify, uh, okay, the assessment that, uh, that uh, which information is material and should be disclosed that this may include information that is relevant for investors' welfare and society even if not uh, evidently relevant or immediately relevant to estimate a company's future cash flows. We clarify actually in some of the, in the blog, it seems there is a new thing, but we simply are moving that boards should take into account, take into account, so maximizing shareholder, taking into account the interest of stakeholders. So there are many, and there are many other things. One interesting point, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, also because, but, but this could be suggestion for their answers. So in, in one, on the one side, we have a trade-off. Now, one important point uh, is uh, this is very complicated for board members. Business judgment rule was evoked. We have very diverse systems all over the world. What we, we, we tackle this issue, but from the point of view of trying to, uh, you know, defend, okay, uh, board, and uh, mm, so protecting board members and management against litigation, which is a new part, which is in the principle. So I would say that uh, there are many other parts, by the way, relevant for many of you, and were commented also by CGI, company groups, also disclosure of information within groups, where are the rights and obligation for the flow of information. But we think that this can be, can provide, you know, a good, uh, I would say, platform, by the way, members then they do comply with principles. So uh, this is where uh, theory and practice join. And this is, I think, where also OECD and ECGI can also, thanks to your you know, input, all what we heard, can really have a, a, an important impact. The consultation will end. The process uh, we were, we're having uh, actually important meeting, and some of you will be there. Uh, in November, uh, February, hopefully endorsed by OECD ministerial next June, and hopefully endorsed by G20, if ever G20 will still be uh, around, uh, Indian presidency uh, by, by Justin Fall. So maybe we can comment then the, the final principles, uh, the published one in the next ECGI meeting. Thanks. Thank you very much, Carmine. I think this is a platform which is really worth working on, and uh, I'm pretty sure that this is going to be um, very interesting for the next few months as, as the foundation for, for the next step on this front. Thanks a lot. And let's see what happens at the next ECGI uh, Responsible Capital Summit. Um, that may be then the next opportunity to go for a revision. Um, Vasiliki, the floor is yours. Um, now we have the the international perspective from the OECD, coordination of different members and regimes. Now, I guess um, the uh, more regulatory, supervisory hats that you are wearing may come into play, but you also offered to take a brief re review of several of the issues of today's discussions. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the kind introduction. I have to say that I wrote down some of the things that were discussed today and tried to make some comments from a regulatory point of view, as you mentioned, from an EU regulatory point of view. I don't know if I have enough time, but I want to point out three things that I, that I want to discuss. The one is the role of regulation. The second is the role of the international cooperation, because for me this is top priority for us in order to progress. And the third one is a personal view on what is uh, responsible capitalism. So let me start with the first one. I think we can all agree that uh, there are similar considerations all over the world. If we're speaking about US or we're speaking about Europe, there are similar considerations regarding all these issues, although the approaches could be different. 
Now we have heard a lot of questions regarding the, uh, for example, the corporate or financial performance and whether this depends on uh, the shareholder base or whether this depends on the strategy that has been integrated, the ESG strategy, I mean, and whether we need reforms, etc. And we have heard different views in this respect. I wrote down one quote which was very interesting for me because it was saying that ESG is not about perfection, it's about progress. In my view, but progress, in order to have progress, we need to start progressing, we need to start moving. So progress for me should be towards achieving environmentally and socially responsible companies and about companies that are well governed. And this is why, how, why corporate governance is all about. And the key is corporate governance for the G, and not only because the corporate well-operated companies can also uh, uh, be responsible in other dimensions as well, in other perspectives. So uh, in this transition, because we're speaking about a transition period, I think it is important to have regulations. It is important also to have the regulations that are appropriate for the specific, uh, in, for the specific uh, period of time because we are speaking about a transition. And regulations can provide direction to the companies. For corporate governance, we know that there is no regulation all over the countries. In Greece, I, take, I, I put right now for, a, for one second the, 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 my hat from the Greek regulator. We decided at some point two years ago, a couple of years ago, to have a law that governs corporate governance, that, I mean, provides the specific um, corporate governance, let's say, principles. Why? Because we wanted to modernize the framework and we wanted to enhance the internal uh, audit mechanism of, of the listed companies. In most of the jurisdictions, of course, in alignment always with the OECD principles. Now, in most of the jurisdictions, we have self-regulations, but it is very important that we have well-governed uh, companies that then we can all believe that then we can, the companies may, let's say, proceed with the G criterion, integrate the G, and follow, comply with the G criterion of the ESG. Now, a lot of discussion has been done has been done for the G, but there has, not be, there has not been so much discussion about the S dimension. And of course the rules, all the, the focus right now is on the E, the environmental uh, dimension. About the E, I want to say about the environmental, that in Europe, as we all know, there have been regulations. We have the taxonomy, we have the SFDR, and we need to see how this will be now applied by all the market participants. So it's up to us on the regulators to make sure that we monitor, and this is where ESMA comes into play because we all try to coordinate among us in order to make sure that we monitor efficiently the, uh, let's say, the, the, the application of the uh, EU regulations. Now, uh, in, in, in my view, what is important, a top priority, is to make sure that we safeguard transparency in the market. Transparency is number one. We want to make sure that disclosure, and Carmine mentioned about disclosure, we want to make sure that disclosure of information regarding the uh, ERG is accurate, is sufficient, first of all, is accurate. We want to make sure that the quality of information is safeguarded. And of course, we want to make sure that there is comparative data regarding all these important issues about ESG. And I'm, saying, I'm speaking about comparable, and Carmine also mentioned about this, and, Com and Commissioner Grenson mentioned about this in the morning, because every, the, the, the information, the provision of information, the supply information is number one for the protection of investors. And we as regulators, we need to make sure that we uh, do everything in order to uh, protect the investors who are seeking climate-related information, and all this information need to be uh, there for them in order to be well-informed. Now, going to the second point, international cooperation. Why do I mention this now? Because in order to make sure that we have comparable disclosure, comparable information, we need to have standardization of disclosure, and standardization should be on a global basis. We need to make sure that we have global standards according to which everybody is aware of what is now uh, under at stake. So Europe has done a lot of progress, but we need to make sure that uh, we, we have an international consensus that, all the, that right now we are setting the standards on a global basis. And for me, especially given that financial markets are interlinked 
and they cooperate and, and, and they operate on a global basis. We make we have to make sure, and now I'm wearing the IOSCO hat, we have to make sure that the standards we are setting are set are are on a global basis. So through OCD that has that is operating on a global basis, through IOSCO, uh, the the governments they have to find solutions, the regulators need to cooperate, they need to coordinate in order to make sure that we share experience and identify the best practices in order to promote better policies and strategies. And uh, I have to say that, for example, the issue of auditing, the issue of raters, who are the sustainability raters, is very important, for example. And this is where, for, we, we, in Europe, for example, ESMA has, done, uh, has uh, tried to address this issue to the Commission and try to see how we can further regulate who are going to be the raters, the EEG raters, the sustainability raters, and who are going to be the, the verifiers. And I think this is also one of the issues that not only Europe, but also uh, it has to be addressed internationally because the issue of verifier and the issue of auditor has to be also addressed on a global basis because we want to make sure that we have a level playing field. And having said this, I want to finish with my personal comment about the responsible capitalism. I think responsible capitalism should be the economic system of this century where we have to take the appropriate measures, not only to protect our environment, but also to achieve social justice. The wise use of resources of all kinds, uh, raw materials, uh, all ecosystems, is not only a buzzword, but the proof of our wisdom acquired through the centuries of industrialization. So therefore, the responsible capitalism recognizes its negative externalities and wants to reduce them, not because they are imposed by regulators like us or technocrats, but because they become the driven of a safer and sustainable, for a safer and sustainable economy. In my view, the responsible capitalism is the new social contract between the society among the society, the enterprises, the companies, and the state. In the realization of this contract, we can count on the EEG criteria that have an ambition to act as a common motivation and indicator about the efforts we do collectively, all players like companies, states, regulators, and citizens. However, we should never think that the EEG is a word written in stone. Indeed, our, soci our societies evolve and our expectations do the same. We must remain awake and innovative. We need to understand and anticipate. We need to safeguard without, retain, without refraining from development. We need to be responsible altogether. So this, for me, is responsible capitalism. Thank you very much, Vasiliki. That was almost the closing remark to this conference, I would yeah, think. Yeah. Uh, it could well stand. Uh, uh, on its own, and uh, but I will still um, at least give the opportunity to uh, you to uh, respond briefly to what you have heard, if you want to. We have two questions on the screen, um, which uh, I will briefly at least uh, address. Uh, but first, I want to turn it over to you. If you still would like to respond to either Vasiliki or Carmine. We are running late, as you know, and uh, so we will have to keep that short. But here is uh, in the back. Yes, please. Uh, hi, hello. I just had a, qu a question on credit rating agencies. As we know, what happened in 2008 was um, related to deficient systems in credit rating agencies, where there was Moody, Standard & Poor's, and the problems that they had in rating credit default swaps badly. Uh, my question to both of you is what, what are regulatory bodies doing to counter this um, now? Um, are there independent government-led uh, credit um, agencies being created or what are the controls being put in place um, on these credit agencies? Thank you. Thanks. I think this is sort of beyond corporate governance and extremely ex important. Maybe, Fasiliki, if you can address this, uh, maybe with one of your heads at least on. Oh, yeah. With the ESMA hat, I can say that the credit rating agencies are supervised directly by ESMA, which is the European uh, uh, authority. So the, there is uh, 
Um, there are rules right now, there is regulation, they try to enforce, and actually they have been very strict in, uh, in trying to enforce uh, the, the regulation regarding CRAs. Now, the, the raters I was saying about sustainability, however, need not, they, they don't need to be uh, CRAs. They could be other uh, raters, other verifiers, but who, ha however, need to be certified, because what we want to make sure is that uh, those that are providing, let's say, assurances are credited. And they are not just any uh, any person, any company, any entity that will provide their, their, their views on these uh, ratings of the EAG. We have seen, we have seen, at least companies, and we know from companies, they say that they get ratings from different EAG uh, raters, and they get completely different results. In, for, uh, the, the, in some of these raters, they are very good, in the others, they are not good. So this needs to be uh, to be clarified to make to make sure that the results are based on a specific methodology that are based on criteria that are uh, recognized. No, one, one second is that simply in the principle we also uh, update uh, talking about the ESG ratings, which I think is a, is a big issue. And by the way, we just sent a report to G20 and so. On. But uh, this is an important issue. At the same time, just uh, one thing. Obviously, uh, now in the, U, in the U27, we have a strong uh, regulation and supervision. Whenever you regulate an uh, oligopoly, uh, there is always the risk uh, to strengthen uh, you know, the oligopoly and uh, that, that the, uh, the entry in a market is, is more difficult. And we see, and with this today you mentioned, there are other oligopolies around, the proxy advisor and others. We should always be very careful in, in treating with the regulation oligopolies. Yeah, that's an interesting issue. We have to make sure that this market, after all, is, uh, is stays open. Let me conclude this with a question from from the screen, i.e. from the uh, online audience. Uh, the first question is something which I think both of our panelists have already brilliantly spoken to. These are questions that we have discussed all day, so uh, I will not enter into this, but I would like to um, pause at the second question. Um, SRD2, like SRD1, has failed to achieve its objective due to lack of enforcement. When will regulators start policing rather than creating new rules? Um, that looks like a question we don't want to debate for too long, but Carmine, maybe your view as the OECD wise man, <laughs> uh, what do you say to this rather okay, better, harsh question? Yeah, better to respond with this now um, uh, hat uh, than no, uh, yeah, the previous yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's uh, uh, one thing is that shareholder rights to, I mean, mm, we can discuss if uh, shareholder rights one uh, uh, had, uh, failed to achieve uh, due to a lack of enforcement. Uh, and when we regulate start policy, I mean, first of all, uh, you know, re regulators are n not those who, who are those who write the rules, especially here in, in Brussels. Uh, second, uh, it's true that uh, uh, it's important to, before changing rules, and maybe one of the, the, of the mistakes after the, the, the financial crisis, we start instead, we, we decided that we needed new rules, but maybe when something happens uh, due for someone breaking existing rules, this does not imply that you need new rules. You need, and I think uh, the anonymous is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is okay, you need enforcement. But also, you need sometimes some courage. We discussed this before also the paper. We, we, why we should go to Broadridge to get the results of how, how mutual funds vote in, uh, in, uh, in uh, listed companies' general meetings. Okay, when we had shareholder rights too, we were trying, uh, as Italy, to say, uh, why don't you do like Italy? All listed companies are obliged to put the full minutes of the general meeting, including how each uh, physical person and investment fund vote. All the other member states, no one won't. Uh, Vasiliki, please. Actually, yes? I see another question, which is very strange, uh, uh, and I, I want to answer to this. It, it says that it seems that regulators want to discuss diverse views and freedom of thought. Isn't that fundamental against the use freedom? I think this is completely the opposite of what regulators do. Because in fact, regulators actually, they, they are not those, as Carmina said, that create the rules. They are those that make, uh, they have to make sure that the rules are applied uh, efficiently and correctly. So it's, uh, there is no reason for the regulators to discourage diverse views. On the opposite, uh, what the regulators try to do is try to make sure that there is a correct application in the sense that they try to uh, have uh, uh, they, they, they urged for this correct application all, uh, uh, within Europe, at least. 
Thank you. You have answered even the most of these fundamental questions. Um, internet comments tend to become very philosophical if, one, if it's getting late, and it is getting late. So I do want to try to close this session at least uh, 10 minutes past the official deadline. I'm not sure what the head of ceremonies are planning. Uh, Marco, do you still want to address the, uh, the, the audience once again? So thanks, Marco, and this session is over. Now Marco concludes the summit, please. I've been tasked to do a brief wrap-up, which is, of course, uh, challenging after such a long day. So I'll give it a, I'll give it a try. So I think we, uh, this morning, uh, tried to define um, irresponsible capital responsible capitalism by defining what is irresponsible behavior. Um, and I think then this afternoon, uh, Tom Gosling came up with the title, uh, Can Shareholders uh, Save uh, Capitalism? And I think that we started that with um, Oliver. Um, I was convinced to start with, but I hope he convinced you that there's no free lunch here, that there are some real trade-offs, and taking the sugar out of, um, out of it uh, might cost some money, um, at least to the shareholders of the companies that decide to do that. So I think that's a very important point, and you know, if that's the only thing that people take away, that's already a very good start. Now, then the other thing uh, that struck me in the afternoon is that once you start from this premise to think through uh, about what we actually are confronted with, uh, it gets very difficult. And Tom asked the question, well, how do you measure then as a trustee of a pension fund what the trade-off, the costs of the trade-offs are? And uh, Catherine Howard said, actually, most people can't even make that trade-off at the moment because they're bound to shareholder value. They can't even do that shareholder welfare trade-off. And then the other thing, of course, that we discussed, uh, motivated by Jonathan's paper, was, well, who authorizes people to make that choice? Who decides? And then once you start thinking through what is actually required to get the kind of legitimacy that you need to take a decision on a thing like taking sugar out of the drink, uh, it actually becomes very complicated. And then, of course, there was a question from the audience to Corinne Smith about, you know, um, well, it's fair enough that we know the wishes of the people of Norway, but if you start imposing, imposing those on the Swedes, you know, that can become complicated. Or, you know, we then joked in the pause if um, Scotland had been independent and you know, found the oil and had a sovereign wealth fund, you know, what would it look like if the Scottish sovereign wealth fund uh, tried to impose uh, its views um, on UK, well, English PLCs? Uh, so I'll just leave you with that thought. Now then, um, in the morning, Patrick, uh, sub proposed, Patrick Bolton proposed an alternative framing which, uh, and he said, well, actually, remember, PI is integration in investment decisions and engagements, and actually, uh, markets are pricing this in. And he was actually very optimistic and said, you know, markets actually are pricing it in, and it's in people's own best interest to act on some of these things, because having sugar in the drink is actually a risk that markets have started to price in. Uh, we could have more of that, but it's already happening. And if people were just a bit more, knew more about it and were more rational, they should actually start taking investment decisions uh, based on this. And I think it was reflected in the afternoon by question, if we could just get um, more into the pricing mechanism, that would work. Now, on the other hand, um, uh, of course, uh, when you talk about the pricing of risk, it always gets very complicated because you have to risk adjust returns. Uh, that's complicated. It's also got a bad name because, I mean, the name is misleading. You call it a premium, uh, which sounds like, you know, a premium service or something where it's actually something, a risk that's being priced. So maybe the, 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 the language there uh, needs some um, thinking in terms of, uh, uh, of that. Um, so, but then the question of the answer to the question of the morning was, well, you know, maybe it's actually markets that are going to uh, save uh, capitalism or markets are going to promote uh, responsible capitalism. Now, then the link, of course, between the morning and the afternoon 
uh, was disclosure because it doesn't matter whether you want to have the kind of make the kind of trade-offs uh, and take a decision on that you actually need to know how much sugar is in the drink and what the consequences are um, and in the morning of course if you want to price risk correctly you have to know um, what goes into the equation and then Carmen mentioned some of these measures that we're going to get well these are only as good as the information that goes into them um, so uh, disclosure is really crucial and I thought it was extremely encouraging to hear uh, Commissioner Crenshaw's uh, keynote which very much tied in with the last panel uh, and it seemed to me at least I hoped I heard that we're going to make some real progress on disclosure not just in Europe and the US but internationally and that's really going to help uh, in this discussion but anyway this was just the beginning um, so but let me close by thanking people um, so this uh, uh, Jonathan said you know one of my slides showed that I've worked very hard <laughs> so uh, actually a lot of people worked very hard on this um, summit uh, so Elo already thanked me so thank you for that Elo but I have a number of other people uh, to thank so first of all the speakers uh, the moderators and the participants both online and here in the room and then of course our sponsors so BNP Paribas Fortis uh, AGS uh, Euroclear and Elu already mentioned the ECGIF. Um, there are three major donors to the ECGIF at the moment uh, AstraZeneca, BlackRock, and Investor AB. I think they, we should probably thank them uh, as well separately. Um, and then, of course, there are people. So, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, Hermann's uh, uh, PA, uh, Cindy van Lieferinge who uh, really did an extraordinary uh, job. And then um, uh, Anne-Sophie Dam uh, and Eva Mertens at Agias, who really helped us a lot with uh, everything. Uh, and then Christophe Marcourt at Euroclear. And then, of course, uh, the ECGI team. Uh, so Carla, uh, Noreen, uh, Suzanne, and of course, uh, we wouldn't be anywhere without Elaine McPartlin. I don't know where she's hiding, um, but Elaine is... Uh, you know, it looks at me, but nothing would happen without uh, Elaine. Um, and, you know, so thank you to Elaine. And, of course, uh, to Herman, um, because he is our chair, uh, both the chair of BNP Paribas Fortis, but also the chair of ECGI. And we couldn't have really put this project together um, and launched it, uh, the summit here today, without your support and help and wisdom, uh, Herman. So thank you very much for that. And... Um, the looking to next year, the next edition shall be in Washington DC, end of October. It's going to be hosted by Georgetown. It's going to be exciting. We're going to discuss many more of these issues and I really liked you know, what you said. Um, I mean, if we can just tinker a little bit, I actually think it was Catherine Howarth who said this. If, you know, if we can tinker a little bit, actually, um, we've achieved a lot over the last 180 years. Uh, we can probably make this work, uh, so let's be optimistic and you know, put more responsibility into this capitalist system that's actually in some ways served us very well. Thank you. <laughs>